So from a historical and medical standpoint, what really did Jesus experience during his last few hours alive? Let's dig in. Before we launch into this topic, I want to warn viewers and listeners that what follows is verbally graphic and may not be suitable for young children. Friends, crucifixion was the most brutal and shameful, despicable way to die. I mean literally nailed to a wooden cross, naked and set up high for everybody to see you. Absolutely horrible. The ancient Jewish writer Flavius Josephus, he called the most wretched of deaths and the Roman historian Julius Paulius said it's the most severe punishment possible. And we know Jesus was killed by crucifixion as we're told by the New Testament and a number of ancient Jewish and Greco-Roman sources like say the Jewish historian Josephus or the Roman politician slash historian Tactus and the strong critic of early Christianity, Lucian of Samosta in Turkey. And they all agree that Jesus was executed by crucifixion by the Romans. Therefore, it is an historical fact. Did you know that we had no archaeological evidence until relatively recently that crucifixion actually took place? We knew it was carried out, but it wasn't until 1968 when outside of Jerusalem, archaeologists they discovered an ankle bone which was part of a skeletal remains of a young man called Johannan, or John in English, who had been crucified. And it seems the nails hit a knot in the wood of the cross and instead of taking the nail out, it remained stuck in his ankle bone and it went with him into the grave. And evidence also seems to suggest that his hands were not nailed to the cross, but instead his arms were tied to the horizontal beam of the cross. So it seems he suffered far less than what Jesus endured. Now before we get into the nitty gritty details of the crucifixion, we have to ask the question, why would Jesus, a carpenter's son, end up being killed in the most brutal fashion available at the time? What did he do to deserve such a death? Now Bart Ehrman uh, rightly asked a question. He says, if Jesus had simply been a great moral teacher, a gentle rabbi who did nothing more than urge his followers to love God and one another, or was an itinerant philosopher, then he would scarcely have been seen as a threat to the Romans and nailed to a cross. Moral teachers were not crucified. And friends, according to the Gospels, Jesus was condemned because of who he claimed to be. And Jesus, he is sentenced to death because of the answer that he gives to the high priest during his questioning after his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus openly claims to not be only the awaited Messiah, but God himself in human flesh. And Jesus, throughout his time in ministry, he uses the scriptures to reveal who he is, that he is seated at the right hand of God and therefore Jesus constantly claims himself to be equal with God himself in terms of authority and power. And at this, the high priest, he tears his vestments because of Jesus' blasphemy. And we see in the book of the Vigilus, everybody, in chapter 24, where it says, he who blasphemes the name of the Lord shall be put to death. So it's a very serious charge that Jesus claims to be God himself. Now a Jewish contemporary of Jesus, a man called Philio of Alexandria, he described blasphemy as anyone who dared call himself God. And that this charge is repeatedly made against Jesus throughout the Gospels by those who criticize him. I mean, the, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they often question him asking who he thinks he is to do things like forgive sins, heal people back to health, cast out demons, raise people from the dead. And Jesus' response is, as he says in John's Gospel, is that he and God the Father 
are one. His authority and power comes from God the Father. So everybody, this, this idea that Jesus was simply a nice teacher who, who told his friends to be good or was some kind of hippie guru are completely off the mark. I mean, as another great scholar once said, John Meyer, he said, a Jesus whose words and deeds would not alienate people, especially powerful people, is not the historical Jesus. How true. And the common idea, everybody, that Jesus was killed for threatening to tear down the temple in Jerusalem does not merit crucifixion. I mean, as Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI once stated, it is during Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin or the high priests that we see what was actually scandalous about Jesus. He seemed to be putting himself on an equal footing with the living God himself. Friends, whether you believe in Jesus or not, everyone needs to grapple with the facts that Jesus claims to be God. And he carried out works of power that have both st astonished and upset people. And it was such that he became a threat to those in authority. So, now that we have established why Jesus was killed, friends, now let's turn to how he was killed. Did you know that the pain that victims of crucifixion suffered was, was so horrific that they had to invent a new word to describe it? The word excruciating, it means literally out of the cross. Imagine, the agony and anguish of this cruel form of death was so severe that the language of the time could not describe it adequately. So they had to invent a new word essentially. It is very clear from the moment the Last Supper finishes, Jesus enters into a great deal of psychological stress as we see Jesus sweating blood in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now this is actually a medical condition called hematidrosis and is, is very, very rare. And the, the Journal of Medicine from 1996 stated that the most common causes of this very rare medical condition were acute fear, extreme stress and intense mental contemplation. Now what happens is that the capillaries around the sweat pores become very, very fragile and begin to leak blood into the sweat glands. And there's many recorded cases of this extreme uh, medical condition which can be found in medical journals. And after this extreme mental stress, Jesus, he is subsequently arrested by the temple guards and they begin to beat him. And he's even being beaten during the questioning by the high priest. And when they condemn him to death for blasphemy, he's handed over to Governor Pilate in order to be legally put to death. And it's at this stage, Pilate has Jesus flogged, hoping that would do and calm the crowds. Now, bearing in mind the result of hematidrosis has now left Jesus' skin very sensitive and weak. And Roman flogging was known for its savagery. Now, it usually consisted of about 39 to 40 lashes, but Roman law, it seems, didn't place a limit and victims were left open to the mercy of whoever was doing the flogging, which unsurprisingly some people were known to die during this. Now the instrument of flogging was a whip of braided leather tongs with metal balls and sharp bits of bone woven into them and when it strikes the victim's flesh it would cause deep bruises and would break open with further blows exposing muscle and bone. Now apparently the person's spine could be clearly seen um, and this kind of deep lacerating would begin at the top of the shoulders and continue all the way down to the back of the legs. Now needless to say, this resulted in massive blood loss. Now to give a kind of idea of just how brutal the violence was of flogging, a 3rd century Roman historian called Eusebius of Caesarea, he once described flogging by the following, and I quote, The sufferer's veins were laid bare, and the very muscles, sinews and bowels were open to exposure. End quote. Now this kind of blunt force would often send victims into hypovolemic shock where the heart would start to pump faster the blood into areas it was lacking, causing fainting or collapse. And the kidneys would, would cease then to produce urine so as to maintain fluids and, and the victims would become very, very thirsty. And we see this in the gospel accounts of Jesus' crucifixion, this condition, because we see Jesus falling a number of times on his ascent to Calvary and the soldiers have to get a passerby to help him carry the cross. And then once he is on the cross, Jesus says he is thirsty. 
and they gave him vinegar to drink. Now, after the flogging, the victims would often then be crucified, but unfortunately, Jesus underwent further violence before crucifixion, um, as he had thorns shoved into his head, and he was beaten again by the Roman soldiers. Remember, when people saw Jesus after the flogging and these beatings, he didn't look human. He was so disfigured and brutalized. And the gospel describes that some people couldn't even look at him because he was so badly tortured. He was quite frightening to look at, to give some idea just how badly he was treated. And then he was forced to carry the heavy crossbeam called the patibulum, which would have weighed around 50 kilograms. And carrying that after the beatings and the flogging was no easy task. Now when they reached the crucifixion site, they would have laid Jesus down and his hands nailed then to the horizontal beam of wood, the patibulum, which at this stage would have probably been separate from the vertical beam that may have been permanently there because it was a site of execution at the end of the day. Now the nails were about seven inches long and were driven through the wrists or an inch below his palm. The reason being is that if he was nailed to the cross through the middle of his hands, the, the, through the middle of his hands, the weight of the body would simply cause the hands to tear and the body would fall off the cross. However, it is possible that by being nailed to the center of the hand, the victim may have been then tied up by the arms, preventing tearing of the hand. Nevertheless, in the ancient world, when they described the hand, it usually included the wrist as well. But the nails would have been driven through the median nerve, which is between the hand and the wrist, which is the largest nerve coming out of the hand. To achieve this, his arms would obviously have to be stretched to reach the holes in the patibulum, and more than likely, his shoulder bones would have been dislocated. The pain of which would have been unlike anything anyone would have experienced. So once he was hoisted up onto the vertical beam of wood, what clothes he had left then were stripped off. And it was then that the nails were driven into his feet. Now, the, the trauma of the nails into bone and flesh would cause the muscles to cramp up and give a relentless throbbing pain. And the nerves in the feet, they only added to the pain. And now the issue of breathing comes into play. I mean, each inhale would have would cause Jesus to have to try and lift himself up to push against the nails in his feet just to inhale. And this would cause the nails then to start to grind against the nerves. And not, only to, and not only that, but don't forget, his back was shredded from the flogging he received earlier on. And this would then rub off against the, uh, the rough timber of the cross and the splinters, etc. And this would go on until Jesus became exhausted and found it impossible to breathe anymore. And with no oxygen in the blood, he would then probably go into cardiac arrest. And with the rapid heart rate of hypovolemic shock, he would have resulted in a collection of fluid in the membrane around the heart and in the lungs, which is called pericardial effusion. Now we know this happened to Jesus because when the Roman soldiers went to make sure Jesus had died, what did the Roman soldier do? He shoved the spear into Jesus' right side. And St. John, he describes it as water and blood pouring out of Jesus' side. And apparently, it would look like clear liquid water at first, followed by a large volume of blood, which would confirm that his heart and his lungs filled up with fluids. So really friends, it's asphyxiation that caused Jesus' death on the cross. Now if you think that's very graphic and violent, in some cases where crucifixions were carried out, the victims were left on the crosses to rot in the sun for days. And some were even placed very, very low to the ground. And depending on their health, they could remain alive for days. Some were even fed to be kept alive. But unfortunately, the smell of excrement would attract wild dogs and all sorts of carnivores and begin to gnaw at the feet and the legs while they're still alive. It's ferocious violence. But in order to make sure the victims died faster, the legs were often broken so that they couldn't breathe anymore. But in Jesus' case, he died faster than they anticipated. And to make sure he died, they shoved a large spear into his side and pierced his heart. And with that, it was confirmed that Jesus was dead on the cross. So to anybody who claims that Jesus somehow survived all of that, or pretended to be dead, have absolutely no idea 
of the reality and the brutal nature of crucifixion. It's actually amazing to note how medically and historically accurate the crucifixion accounts of Jesus in the Gospels really are. Friends, I did not make this presentation um, in case anybody thinks out of some sort of weird fascination with violence. Absolutely not. But for the simple reason of the need for us as Christians and indeed for those of you who don't take this historical event serious to take on board what Jesus actually went through for us on the cross. And it's not surprising that many people today don't take this very seriously because look at so many of our images and our sculptures of the crucifixion today are very clinical, they're very clean um, and they're often a form of some form of subjective art and in some churches <laughs> one would almost need the artist beside them to try and figure out and understand what the image or sculpture is trying to represent and then we wonder why people don't know the faith today much of it is because we've watered down our theology and our history of the whole Christian endeavour and placed subjective deconstructionist art in our churches and in our homes. It's important, friends, that we understand as best we can the brutality of the crucifixion and to not let the reality of that get lost. Now, mind you, I'm not for one moment suggesting that we have very bloody and scary images and sculptures of the death of Jesus in our churches, but at least representations that leave us in no doubt of what's going on and to be faithful to the gospel accounts. Subjective imagery of Christ and the story of Christ is fine if you have faith, but to teach and to show those who don't have it what Christ is about, then we need to be faithful in our representations of the Christ story. Now, the reality and the truth of Jesus in the gospels I find is far more attractive to young people so friends, look at during the Gospel on Palm Sunday and the Gospel on, on Good Friday, when the authorities are trying to decide what to do with Jesus and the crowds cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Now you know what this means and what the Lord, out of love, did for you and me. Hi everybody, Father Bill here. If you enjoyed our presentation and would like to hear more like it, then please leave a like, share and subscribe to see future content. And until the next video, ciao.